David Guthrow. I'm here with, with my friend and colleague, Tiagi, and this is take number four or five, because one of the things that makes this recording unusable to other people is when it's not actually being recorded. So I guess it doesn't actually make it a recording. So so, so the the, uh, the topic was going to be, had you been able to be here in person, Tiagi, was improv. Is it the meaning of life or does it put meaning into life? So for some who may not know you, I've known you for over 40 years, and I know you to be <clears throat> a brilliant game designer and a structural designer, performance enhancer, professor, and, and a fine chef. So with all that as a background, what, what's your connection to improv? How did you come to that as something that, uh, that you find interesting, fascinating, and important in life? David, I'm a flake, which is another way of saying I'm an improv person. It took me a long time, 75 years, before I realized I am an improv person and that shapes, that defines my life. So given that, I have never planned to do anything. I don't plan what I want to do. For example, I anytime I plan, God gets me. Yeah. I planned to come to AIN conference. And I started planning in detail. Zoom, an important person in my life died, and I have to go get some important inheritance claiming of an important inheritance. So anytime you plan, life teaches you a lesson by making sure that plan is useless, unnecessary, cannot be done. Okay, and what is my connection with the improv? All my life, I have four important principles. Life, is an improv exercise. And life is an oxymoron. There is no such thing as this is correct, this is incorrect. Life, anything you do in life is something you do spontaneously in an improv fashion. But more importantly, everything you do in life is an important thing which helps you go to the next stage. And the other important thing in life is life is a metaphor. Another important thing in life is you keep repeating things again and again. The important thing you got to remember life repeats itself and you repeat everything. So given all of these, you put meaning into life, life puts meaning into you. All of which you will not understand what I'm talking about <laughs> until it is two months from now. So, so Tiagi, how do you get, uh, some people, spend an incredible amount of time <clears throat> planning because they've been trained that way or, or found it that way. And and uh, how do you get people to be comfortable letting go of having to have everything programmed for the minute? Because some people do it quite naturally. A lot of folks coming at this conference totally get that. But there's others that that do not. And, how, you know, what does it take for them to be able to let go and actually trust that that they can work with whatever happens to them? Just to give you straighten up a delusion, <laughs> most people who come to the conference, most improv friends I have are among the most uptight, uptight, detailed <laughs> planning. Okay, so what I'm going to do when people don't get my joke? Should I be explaining it? When I explain it, should I explain it in a patronizing fashion or in a serious fashion? So just because somebody says I'm an improviser, 
doesn't necessarily mean that person is an improviser. It's a personality trait. You are an improviser, not because you plan to be an improviser, but because you were born that way. And I'm making all of these things up. Okay, so people don't believe in living spontaneously. And to me, if you're a trainer, you got to be spontaneous. Because when you got a group of participants in front of you, they got so much experience, so much information, so much knowledge, so much wisdom, for you not being able to seize upon it and take the first step of andragogy and say, people who come to any training session, any learning session, bring a lot of things with them. And your job is to bring it out, make use of it, things of that nature. And it is not only for adults. You know what? Children know more than you do, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I, uh, when we uh, a lot of people when they think about improv, they think of performance improv, and this conference about imp implied improv. So, um, what are some of your top tips for applying improv outside the realm of being on stage with it? Because the focus is on on applying it. I think some people get locked into I have to be a performer. How how do you Okay. Tips. Yes. Rule number 18 about life. Life is a performance. <laughs> you perform through life. You don't do things. You do things assuming somebody's looking at you. Assuming you're in the midst of a performance. You got a mask. You, you are in a performance. That is what is happening to you, David. So don't think performance is different from life. Life is a performance. Okay. I keep repeating things because. <laughs> but I think you mean the point that life repeats itself. So, you know, you're doing what life is doing. So it's okay. Yes. And it is very, very important for you to keep repeating things because when you repeat things, people think that is profound. It must be an important thing. Otherwise, you will not be repeating it. And if you don't get the significant meaning about that, then there is something wrong with you. So you try hard to make meaning out of it. <clears throat> And uh, that is what life is all about. And people who say, hey, I'm going to use more of improv. Therefore, I must be a performer. I'm going to tell you wrong. That's not how you should think. You should live. And uh, that is what improv is all about. Do what you want to do. So I'm going to take a different angle on this now because I mean one of the the uh, you, know, you, were really, you were taking an angle before. Uh, it was more of a curve. This is an angle. It's a little a little sharper diversion from our currently scheduled interview. Good. Uh, you know, um, a, a friend and colleague, Amy Emmonson, has written a lot about psychological safety and things like that, and and. Uh, how might you overcome? Because I think that's sometimes a challenge when deciding to do improv. How do you, you know, overcome people's concern about maintaining psychological safety when you're doing improv? Because a lot of times you, I use the word improv and people start, they start sweating and I haven't even said anything other than the word. So, you know, how do you balance sort of the, the unpredictability of improv with a concern for uh, allowing people to feel psychologically safe? I know it's kind of a philosophical question, but it's Thursday. Yep, Thursdays are important days. And how do you maintain psychological safety? How do you provide psychological safety to other people? The secret is simple. Don't have 
any goal, don't have any objective, don't have any plan. If you don't have a goal, you're not going to fail. You fail only if you have a goal. You fail more gloriously. Epic failure, you not only have a goal, but you believe in the goal and you are going to achieve the goal, come hell or I water. If you don't have a goal, if you don't believe in a goal, let whatever is going to happen, happen. By the way, that is philosophical, religious, spiritual, but don't have any religious or spiritual goals either. So is that when you're talking about that, is it from the perspective of a person who is who is guiding the conversation or for for that person to not have a goal? Are you talking about for the, the people in the in the class or whatever, not setting up a goal for them? If I'm supposed to be guiding something, I don't have a goal. If you come to my session expecting words of wisdom, I say, give up the goal. <laughs> Let it flow. Go with the flow. Wow, I landed in California. <laughs> so those are important things. I don't think you should go with the goal when you are interacting with somebody. I don't think the person interacting with you should have a goal. And you tell me, but I'm hired to train people on nuclear physics. They pay me for doing that. And how do I do that? I say, go ahead, do it. What do you know about nuclear physics? And you ask people, what do you already know about nuclear physics? And most people will may say nothing. You say, that's great. Let us create nuclear physics and let us figure out what it is all about. And does somebody know anything about nuclear physics? Before you know it, somebody is going to say, ah, a nucleus consists of protons and electrons. I say, how do you know it? And they say, I read it someplace. How do you know whatever you read is true? And so on and so forth. And the people compare what they know. You may be trying to teach nuclear physics, but they learn the meaning of life. It doesn't really matter. So I have maybe just two more maybe two or three more questions. And one of them, I know you've worked a lot internationally. Um, what are some of your cross-cultural observations on the use of improv as a learning methodology? One of the universal phenomena around the world, everybody is uptight. And they don't know how to relax. They don't know how to let go. And the most uptight people, as I try to sneak this thought into, or the improvisers, <laughs> the most uptight people are people who say you should live every moment in your life. You should have spiritual values and things of that nature. So people, whether they believe in improvising or not to believe in improvising doesn't matter whether you are in Maori group in Australia or you are in Vancouver, it doesn't really matter. You stop from time to time and ask yourself, what should I be doing now? There is something very, very important. People think they are missing out on important things in life because they are not planning, they don't have a goal, and things of that nature. This is something, a universal phenomena. Mm -hmm. and there are groups of people to whom the most important thing in life is not to have any important thing in life. They defeat themselves by saying, I want to be spontaneous. 
And the Buddha said, it is very, very important. You should let go of all the desires in life. And some idiot kid who says, ah, if you let go of all desires in life, is that not a desire? When they say, I should let go of my desires in life, are you not disobeying your nirvana formula, things of that nature? That is so true. That's a very interesting, powerful way of, of looking at it, right? <laughs> to, to, uh, to intentionally not be intentional. <laughs> so I'm going to let go of, of my list of questions. And, and so, so um, oh, what's let one... me get the list of <laughs> So what, what's one question about improv that uh, you think you wish I had asked you, but I actually didn't? So in other words, what would you like to say? <laughs> oh, good. How do you define improv? If you have to define something, it's no longer improv. So you don't define it. And uh, what do you recommend? If I were to recommend a book to you, there are two books I would recommend. One is, I forgot the name of the book, but that doesn't stop me from coming up with the name. I think it is Training to Imagine. Okay, that's Kat Coppett's book? Hey, I was going to claim it is my book. Oh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, I'll just edit that part out. Oh, tell me more about that book. Who wrote it? <laughs> oh, Kat Coppett wrote it. And it is a great, wonderful book. The interesting thing about training to imagine is Kat does not say improvise. Implied in it is you improvise with a purpose, which is a dangerous thought for you to have. If you have a purpose, you cannot improvise. And the other book is Improv Wisdom by Patricia Madsen Ryan. My God, my memory is coming back. I was told if you get old, your memory is the second thing to go, but it is coming back. So these are people who practice what they preach and what they practice is improv should have a purpose. And the purpose could be improv should not have a purpose. Good. I, you know, I never expect I'm going to get a straight answer to anything. I, I mean, a singular answer, right? Because as you said earlier, there's two, yeah. you know, whatever is true is also not true, right? And whatever's false is also true in, in some respect. So um, just, to, just to close this off, any um, tips if you're going to have, because I know that Everything can be a two by two matrix or there's four this, that, and the other thing. But if there were two or three tips that you said, you know, if you just really embrace these, you can't help but be successful as an improviser, uh, applied improviser, who's actually not trying to be an applied improviser. Good. Tip number one, forget about being an improviser or not being an improviser. Live your life. <laughs> Be a child. Assume that you have no responsibilities. Assume next month, just for the fun of it, you're not going to pay your mortgage. I'm I'm imagining that. I may actually may not have to imagine that. <laughs> Good. Keep organizing conferences. <laughs> and they will soon reach that stage. And other important thing is spend a lot of time with children and with dogs. They don't plan. They just do what they want to do. And now, rule number three, anything you do today this evening, ask yourself, 
why did I do that? And what, what would have happened if I did not do that? And what did I learn from that? And when will I do it again? And when I do the same thing again, how would I do it differently? Because that's such a thing as doing the same thing again. You know, I just uh, one last thing. I remember many years ago, you recommended a book to me uh, by James Carsey called Finite and Infinite Games. And that the purpose of the infinite game is to keep the play going, and which is kind of like what you want life to do, to keep it going. And it, it seems like, I didn't think about that in the context of improv, but it seems to be- Neither that, did I. I got it from you now. Now oh. <laughs> I will use it in every one of my presentations and make people think I have been living by that James Corsi rule all my life and things of that nature. Well, I, I feel very grateful that I could provide you with that. <laughs> Good. And and again, Tiagi, thank you so much for your time today. I'm so sorry I won't be seeing you at the conference. I know that you do have other important things. You're, you and your family are going to be a bit Making 6, enough miles money away. to pay my mortgage. Yes. Right. <laughs> and, if, and if it's too much and you're worried about what to do with it, now that you got me thinking about paying my mortgage, feel free, interact. I mean, I accept all kinds of things. And uh Good. Again, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you, David. You're one of the greatest improvisers. And you landed from Daisy. <laughs>